Hey guys, and welcome to the Animal Training Academy podcast show. I'm your host, Ryan Cartledge, and I'm really excited that you have decided to take time out of your busy schedules to come and hang out today. We're really grateful for you tuning in. And if you have been listening to the podcast for a while, we really appreciate this. Thank you so much. Hopefully you have subscribed so that you never miss an episode. But if not, or if you are new to the show, get yourself over to iTunes, Stitcher, AnimalTrainingAcademy.com or whatever it is you are listening to this podcast on and hit the subscribe button to make sure you don't miss a single episode. We are bringing you today's episode on behalf of the Animal Training Academy or ATA membership. If you like the conversations in these podcasts, then I want to invite you to continue them with like-minded people within the ATA membership area, which you can find out more about over on the ATA website. Within the membership, you can get access to twice monthly live web classes, the back catalogue of previous web classes, plus a huge library of videos and projects to problem solve different training situations and we're a sociable bunch with an exclusive private facebook group forums area and whatsapp chat groups it's like a netflix social media platform for animal behavior nerds but we will get started on today's episode where we will be talking to one airy bailey as a native Floridian, Eri has always had a love and appreciation for the unique ecosystem and state she was raised in. Her career started out at a small zoo in the Orlando area where she worked mostly with reptiles. This is where she found her passion for training, enrichment and animal behaviour. There she worked with crocodilians, venomous snakes and many other animals. She found a deep interest in finding new ways to enrich them. Following her desire to learn more about behaviour, she sought out a job with Natural Encounters Incorporated and was hired in January of 2009. She is a current general board member of IAATE, the International Association of Avian Trainers and Educators, and the chair of the Professional Development Committee. She also sits on the board for IATCB, which is setting the standard and raising the bar for avian trainers around the world with the new avian certification test and has been certified herself as a professional bird trainer, CPBTKA, by the International Avian Trainers Certification Board. Always continuing her education, she has attended, presented and taught at workshops, conferences and courses on animal behaviour and the science behind it throughout her career. Her love of sharing information and teaching animals and humans alike is why she says she has one of the best jobs in the world. So without further ado, it's my very great pleasure to welcome one Airy to the show today who is patiently waiting by. Airy, how are you? I am great, Ryan. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited. It's my first podcast. Woohoo! So glad to uh, be giving you this opportunity to do your first podcast. And uh, you're in Florida. You've been at work today. Is that correct? Oh, yeah. Today I have been at work and it was an interesting day. We have a hurricane brewing out there in the Gulf. So we're getting some interesting weather that affected some of our shows and bird behavior in general. But thankfully for our area, the storm is headed a little bit north of us. So we're just feeling some of the side effects without having to do too much actual hurricane prep. <laughs> For those of us in the world who live in areas where there's not hurricanes, are probably wondering what hurricane prep <laughs> looks like. Hey, you have you describe your job as one of the best jobs in the world. What does what does a day at work look like for you? Do you call it work? I mean, it's work. I go to work. I get a paycheck. So in that sense, yes. But I really do love what I do. I um, I work at a major theme park in Orlando, Florida, and I manage Natural Encounters, two bird shows at the park. So we do a show that happens on a stage, and then we do another show where we fly 
big flocks of macaws across the park for a half of a mile. They land on a location and we talk to the guests for about eight to 10 minutes and then they fly back home. And our stage show has many mixed species of birds doing different behaviors um, in routines. And we have a lot of trainers working at both of those shows. And my role is to um, manage both of the shows within the park. So one aspect of many within NEI, uh, but I do really love what I do, especially in this role, because I get to work um, closely with helping our staff grow. And I think my love of behavior is not limited to just non-human animals. And the more I work with training humans to train, the more I really find that to be the most rewarding part of my job. Sounds exciting. Hurricanes and flocks <laughs> of macaws flying around theme parks. Cool. We're going to we're going to uh, unpack all of this human side of working with animals and especially when working in teams uh, throughout this podcast today. But before we dive into that, and thank you for sharing that, that little window into your world there, Ari, but I'm really curious to, to go back to that time when you're working in this small zoo in Orlando, Florida, working with all those reptiles and you started to find this interest in, in behaviour and stuff. Can you take us back to that time and, and share with us kind of where you first started to learn about positive reactions reinforcement uh, and maybe share some stories from that time? Sure. So um, I worked at a small um, kind of family themed park that's in the area. It's uh, family owned and operated. It's a non AZA facility. So we had a really small department. I um, kind of wanted to start off in the field. Um, I figured that out while I was taking some college courses. Um, and when I finally started applying in the field, I applied at this facility specifically amongst a couple others because I thought I would get a really good um kind of overview because they have many different animals in their collection, but they have a small staff. It was a good way to get my foot in the door as well. Um, they basically had a zoo services staff of seven, and I was a part-time employee when I started. My job mostly was hanging out in the petting zoo with goats, and um, we had a little zebu cow, mini zebu, and a llama. And um, I sold petting zoo food to guests and got to talk to them about the animals in the petting zoo. We also had an aviary with lorikeets where we sold nectar for the lorikeets and people could go in and feed the lorikeets and we had a couple of shows in the park, very Florida. This park um, is very true to how you think about Florida. They had alligator wrestling show. They had a show called the jump Roo show where gators jumped out of the water to get chicken and um, an up close encounter show. But our job wasn't the entertainment side. It was um, mainly the husbandry and care of all the animals in the park. And that was everything from emus to a Florida black bear to seven different species of crocodilian. We had all of the native venomous snakes that you can find in Florida. Um, a lot of native animals, but some non-native. And my boss was very encouraging our curator um, for me to kind of explore anything. And so I kind of learned a little bit about enrichment and ran with it. So I developed a enrichment program for um, our department to follow. And the more I got to do things, the more excited I got about it because I was seeing behavior and reactions from the animals um, when I was offering them different things. So Basically, I got hired on full time and I was there for about three years and became the lead keeper at that facility. And along the way, tested lots of really fun enrichment. We did some boomer balls on the ends of rope for some of our alligators in our big main lake. So we had 12 foot alligators and we would throw the boomer ball in there and they would bat it around and do all kinds of things. We tossed... Um, 
tomatoes and lettuce in with our saltwater crocodiles. But really the best part, other than getting the animals to use some natural behaviors of um, being more active during the day, was that uh, it gave us a way to interface with the guests. So guests were super interested. I think one of the main questions I would get there from guests is, is it dead? Because (laughs) alligators and reptiles in the heat usually just don't do anything. So a way for them to see the animals actually using their behavior and um, doing anything was exciting for the guests. So it gave us a window to talk more about um, what enrichment is and why we do it and explain how behavior works to the guests that came to the park, which was really fun. Uh, Another thing that we did there was an Aldabra tortoise encounter. So we would sell carrots on a stick for five bucks and (laughs) we would let people in and they could feed the Aldabra tortoises. That was our only experience in zoo services that was on mic. And most of the zoo services staff hated to do it. They were always very happy when I was there because I loved it, which has been something that I've always enjoyed. And I think I gained a lot of skills just being able to practice that in our quiet little corner of um, the park there. Now I get to do it on a regular basis daily, which is really fun. So I developed a lot of skills. I learned a lot of things that were not the right way necessarily, but um, I think all of that experience has really helped me grow and learn and look back and have some really good memories from it as well. Yeah, and enrichment's a, a pretty big thing for you, isn't it? I remember being in Dallas with you and we gave, one of my favorite things we did was give one of the Ibis, I don't even know what it was, it was like some weird plastic ball thing and we shoved it through the mesh and the Ibis was just <laughs> biting the end of it and it would wobble and it was having a great time anyway. Um, now you're on the, what is it, the enrichment committee for the IAAT, IAAATE? So I used to, it is IAATE, yep, Um, and I used to be on the enrichment committee, but my role has kind of taken me to be more um, on the professional development committee there. So since I'm the chair and that committee I've been dedicating a ton of time to, I've stepped off of the enrichment committee for IAATE, but it doesn't mean I don't have a lot of passion for enrichment anymore. There's just some amazing people now that sit and chair that and are on that committee to keep it moving forward. And so you're at this park and doing all of this enrichment with reptiles, which in and of itself is super cool. Where did that kind of, did that lead into you being more interested in specifically uh, training animals or is that, was you, were you doing that at the same time? How, how did you, how did you transition from there to going and seeking your job with natural encounters? And <laughs> tell, tell the, the listeners of the show, what is, what is natural encounters? A lot of people in, in the show might not have heard of natural encounters and they don't, might not know what the IAAATE is. So maybe unpack that for us as well. That'd be great. Sure. So, um, at the facility I was at, I had, well, at the time I had never heard of natural encounters. I think a lot of people seek out natural encounters from all over the world to work with them. Um, but at the time I just was lucky that I lived in the same city as natural encounters and it worked out for me. Um, the reason that I sought them out was at that facility that I worked at. Um, I basically, I, um, was wanting more. So working there, I had a wonderful boss. My curator was super encouraging, but the facility's focus was more on family entertainment and less on, um, kind of what our industry working in zoos and aquariums is focused on, which is welfare. Of course, we want guests to enjoy being in our facilities, but I wanted to learn more about the animal side of things. So I um, wanted to write papers and I wanted to be a part of organizations. There's a cool organization called CAG, which is a crocodilian advisory group. And I started to be involved with that. I wanted to go to conferences and that facility didn't have a, a lot of interest in supporting that sort of thing because that's just not what their focus was. So as I was doing things and learning things, I I needed that support to take it to the next level. And 
so I started looking for another position and I found out I had heard of natural encounters, I guess, once before in the past. Um, a coworker had gone to a workshop with natural encounters. And so I knew a little bit about it, but I didn't really know what they did. Um, so I just started searching for jobs in the area and I found out about Natural Encounters. I applied and I was very annoying, I think. <laughs> and I applied and I emailed and kept asking from about October until January until I got an interview. And then I was hired on as a seasonal employee in January of 2009. Um, so Natural Encounters, a little bit about Natural Encounters is, um, it's a company run by Steve Martin. He has been doing bird shows for over 40 years. He's world renowned animal trainer, uh, to see him train is pretty amazing. And I always learn something from Steve and I'm lucky enough to get to work with him and have him as a mentor. Um, we do the two bird shows at the major theme park that I work at. And then we do bird shows around the world. So we just currently had a bird show that was similar to the McCall flights at the Indianapolis zoo. We've done lots of shows at other places that are more stage show. We also do consultant work. So Steve um, and some of our other top trainers will go to other facilities and help their trainers learn more about behavior and how to train their animals through the power of um, behavior change and the science of behavior. And um, we also do professionals workshop usually twice a year. And um, we invite professionals to come spend a week with us. They get to hear Steve Martin and Dr. Susan Friedman, who I know you have done a podcast podcast with before. And, um, she's another wonderful mentor that we get to work with. They both lecture and then we break our students up into groups and we, um, take them out into the actual field and apply all of the things that they learned in lecture, um, in real time. So they have a practical element to it as well. Um, and it's really cool. The workshops are probably one of my favorite things that I get to be involved in. I've been a team lead on the workshops many times, and it's so rewarding to see people's minds open up to the science of behavior change, watch them make breakthroughs with their birds in, you know, just a couple of days, even a couple sessions. Um, we see a lot of progress. So it's a really exciting thing that Natural Encounters does. And we also have a conservation fund. Um, Natural Encounters, not a lot of people know, but Natural Encounters has um, the Natural Encounters Conservation Fund, which um has a board of directors and we raise money and then that money goes to in situ projects around the globe as well. Um, but IAATE is something that is very near and dear to my heart. Um, I never really had a reason to want to work with birds. I didn't care what I worked with. It could be bats or cockroaches or <laughs> just about anything. I just wanted to train and learn about behavior and work with animals. Um, so IAATE is the International Association of Avian Trainers and Educators. It is a organization that helps um, people in the field share information. Um, the professional development committee that I chair helps uh, with a mentorship program. We have a lot of member benefits that are really great. We have a conference once a year as well. It's really just a wonderful way to share the most current information with our colleagues in the field, which is really great. And Steve Martin was actually um, one of the founding members of IAATE, which is pretty cool. And we just passed our 20 fifth year, I'm pretty sure, um, as an organization. So it's pretty neat to be able to be a part of all that. Yeah, fantastic. And another acronym, the world loves acronyms. Yeah, they do. <laughs> <laughs> and that we we did, we said in your bio there, and, and I couldn't unpack it because I didn't actually know the exact words to fit the letters, is the I-A-T-C-B. Can you uh, unpack that one for the audience? and tell everyone what that is. 
Sure. So IATCB is the International Avian Trainers Certification Board. Um, We are an organization that is only about five years old and spawned from an idea that started within IAAT. And Steve was actually one of the driving forces for this. So um, we work with a professional testing corporation called the PTC, Professional Testing Corporation, another acronym. Um, They are the same uh, organization that uh, works with the dog trainer certification and many other certifications that I probably could not ever remember all those acronyms for around the world. And um, they're they help us and have helped us to develop a certification test. So the test is for avian trainers. It is um, knowledge-based. So those letters after my name mean that I am a certified professional bird trainer. That's the C certified CPBT. There we go. Another acronym. (laughs) And then the dash KA is knowledge assessed. So this is not a practical um, skill assessment. It is just knowledge-based. Um, you must have three years of experience as a professional in the field to be able to take the test. And then after that, anybody can take it. And the test has been written and reviewed by many prominent figures in our field to make sure that we are testing at a level that um, we feel meets the needs of our field. But also the Professional Testing Corporation helps us with all the many statistics that they have that um, apply to testing in general so that we can set up the test to be um, as helpful, but also um non-biased as possible. So they help us kind of as a third party. Um, The test has been great. I think currently we have, I don't want to say because I don't want to be quoted wrong, but I know we have quite a few of certified trainers now out there in the world. A handful of them are international. And um, we just rolled out a um, animal training certification. So now we're branching out and trying to offer these certifications to more areas in the field. So the first thing we did was offer a general one and we'll Um, an animal trainer certification and that will roll out this fall will be the first round of testing for that which is pretty exciting and it's really just a way to raise the bar every person I have talked to that has taken this test has said that the experience of studying and going over the materials and getting prepared for this test has been such a great learning experience in itself that I tell people if you're not sure if you're ready to take it all those reference materials are on the website which is iatcb.org and um you can study for it even if you're not ready to take it and just start to absorb all of that information. There's a bunch of Dr. Friedman's papers that are references, um, papers off of Natural Encounters website, which is naturalencounters.com, um, position statements from IAATE off their website, which is IAATE.org. So the list of references is right there for you on the IATCB website, and that'll give you an idea of where you might be and if you're interested in taking the test but studying is free and learning's free so I encourage people even if you're not ready to take the test check it out because it's a great way to gather um, a really a wealth of information just by looking into it so two questions uh, firstly what do you think what was the driving um, forces, discussions, considerations, reasons for uh, moving towards this certification? What kind of um, things were you seeing in the industry that made you think that this is something that we need? And secondly, if I'm a listener on this podcast and I want to go do this, um, what, what is the process? We go to these websites and then, and then what happens next? Sure. So I think it was an important um, step in our field to just 
take what we do to the next level of credibility in general. Um, you know, our job is hard to explain to someone outside of the field. You know, you tell them you're a bird trainer and nobody really knows what that means. But um, the certification test is a way to gain credibility with what we do and show people that this is a really high level, high skilled um, job that we do every single day. But it's also so important within the field that we continue to raise the bar that we expect someone who's working with birds to be able to provide the highest levels of welfare for those birds that are under their care and um, training by giving birds choice and control over their environment is so important to welfare and understanding how behavior works is just so important to welfare and I think by developing a test like this, we're saying these are the skills that you need to learn and here's the knowledge that you need to start. And this is a good jump off point so that you know what you can do to really provide good welfare because everybody in this field is working with animals because we all love animals. So if someone isn't providing good welfare, there's no doubt in my mind it's not because they don't care. It's just that they don't know yet. They haven't gotten there. When I worked at that facility before I worked with Natural Encounters, there's a lot of things I could look back on. We had parrots there that I could have done better, but I didn't know better. I was doing the best I could with the knowledge I had at that time. And I think this is a way to say, here's what we can all do to know better and take that next step. And so if you do want to take that next step and you're interested in taking the test, um, visit the website and there is a little button on there that says get certified and you can click it. And then there's a little link that takes you to the PTC website. It's embedded in the first paragraph of that page. um, And that will take you to the handbook. The handbook has every bit of information you would need to know about signing up. And We only offer the certification twice a year. It is a test where you have to go to a testing facility. Within the United States, there are plenty of testing facilities available and they'll find one near you. If you're international, they'll have to set one up for you. So there's a little bit of a fee included in that if you're going to be international. But if you can get a bunch of people that you work with or in your area that are also interested, you can split that fee and it really isn't too bad. Um, the process is you sign up, you get a testing date, you study, and then you go in and you take the test and um, it is monitored and um, you'll get your results within a couple of weeks of taking the test. And the test is a 200 question test and those questions are pooled from uh, over 250 um, questions. And that's how we get our test for everybody who takes it. And um, all those results are kept by PTC and also um, the statistics are taken. We have board meetings for IATCB every month and we meet at least once a year to go over um, how we can continue to better the test as we move forward, taking all the statistics that they've gotten into account. We make sure that our pass fail rate meets what it should, um, things like that. So we're always working on it. It's not something that's just set and that's the test that somebody would take in 10 years. It's going to continue to evolve just like anything else. <laughs> yeah, fantastic. I really appreciate you sharing all of that information. And we will link to all of the stuff in the show notes, everyone, if you wanted to. Um, go somewhere to find it all easily Um, so you don't have to go back and and find all of the specific websites we talked about we'll link to all of that stuff in the show notes for this episode hey Eri moving forward I will firstly thank you again because I love hearing about people's behavioral odysseys Um, but I'd really like to talk about what you call and what it's something that you've already mentioned is you are passionate about, and that is, I'm going to quote a paper you wrote, uh, the art and skill of learning as humans in the animal field. Uh, so we're going to unpack this over the next wee bit in this podcast episode. Uh, so what, what, is, what does this mean for you? Why, why did you decide to write this paper about the art and skill of learning as humans in the animal field? So for me, like I said earlier, I have found that um, training people is more rewarding than animals in a lot of ways and seeing 
the fallout from that is just one of my favorite things. So, you know, the birds learn something, but if I have worked with somebody and helped them learn a new skill and then they apply it and then they get a new behavior from a bird, I get to see a person and a bird learning something new, having a light bulb moment, which is really cool. But I think it's bigger than that because I think a lot of people want to be good trainers with their animals, but they aren't always as good with um, training their coworkers and their management staff and everybody around them. So being a good learner is something that is very important to a team environment. And there is some skill that I don't think we really get taught as to how to be a good learner. And if you are not adept in this or you're not comfortable with learning, it can create a very challenging team environment. And I see this a lot when I visit other facilities, um, when even within a team on occasion um, that I'm working with, that it's just sometimes the most difficult thing is for people to learn. And um, the best way to learn is to encourage feedback. And I have been positively reinforced for the way that I personally take feedback. And I have always gotten good feedback about taking feedback. And it was something that I wanted to share with other people because I know it has helped me grow exponentially and the positive reinforcement made me want to do it more and share it and make sure that other people could do the same thing. Um, When I see somebody who takes feedback well, the things that I look for, what does that look like is um, they seek it out, first of all. So if you want to um, improve any skill, you need feedback. And to get feedback, the first thing you can do is simple. Just ask for it. So if you're able to ask for feedback, you're more likely to get it. And then it has to be a comfortable environment. Sometimes giving feedback can be uncomfortable if you think that the person you're giving it to doesn't want to hear it. So that would punish the behavior of offering that feedback to a person. So if you're the learner and you're asking for feedback, your body language should invite that person in. It should be excited and engage to make sure that that person knows that you're really wanting to hear all of the things that they're telling you. And then Um, thanking that person for offering that information and following up on it too. Um, After you've applied it later and that person who offered feedback isn't there, going to them and saying, oh, I just tried that thing you told me and it really worked is going to get that person to offer you more feedback in the future. So I think it's just that is the kind of environment I want to work on as a team. I want everybody to feel comfortable. I don't care if you've been there for, you know, six months or 20 years. I want everyone to feel comfortable to ask questions and offer information and um, speak their minds as long as it's in a kind and honest way. I think everyone is capable of doing that. It's just about talking through all of the things that go into it. And so when I hear people frustrated because they don't feel heard by management, if they're at another facility and they're trying to get an idea across and they just feel like they don't want to offer um, their ideas up anymore because they just keep getting shot down. I, I want to encourage those people to, to find a training plan that works. How can we offer this idea up in a way that it will be heard instead of pointing the finger and saying, oh, but my management, they, they don't want to listen to me about that. Uh, it's That's not what we would do with our birds. We take responsibility for our birds' behavior and we should do the same in the situation with our fellow co-workers. So that's really what inspired me. Uh, we have people come all the time to our workshops and our students are just really they have always commented that they're blown away by the way we work with each other, how much we care about each other, how much we support each other, and that they wish that their facility could be similar. And I, I think that's completely doable. And so I wanted to help people have some sort of jump off point to try to create that environment where they work and at home too. I mean, it works with your, in your daily life, not just while you're on the job. <clears throat> yeah. And I was lucky enough as, as I alluded to earlier, but didn't really explain properly. I, to get the opportunity to spend some time with Natural Encounters uh, in Dallas in 2012, I believe, uh, and, and you came down for for a couple of days in that year, I believe, I think, if my memory serves me correctly. Um, and so, from my experience, to just build on what you said there, I left with that same impression uh, that it was a very uh, safe place to 
be yourself <laughs> just you know not have to worry about um, all of those little things that uh, come into human interactions uh, and you said a quote from your your article is if a learner is comfortable with open and honest communication then feedback becomes information instead of criticism correction becomes guidance and failures become learning opportunities so how how important is it to you that failure is is something that we celebrate is that is that, is that an appropriate mm-hmm. way of asking yes. that question Can you you unpack that for us a little bit, please, Eri? For sure. So um, that's a definite, like, takeaway from Steve being a mentor of mine. One of my favorite quotes of his is that uh, mistakes are just an opportunity to try again um, with more information. So for me, once you take the emotion out of failure and you look at it as a the way you would maybe look at training a bird, a rep, and that rep wasn't successful. What do I do to help the bird be successful next time? It's not beating yourself up over it or feeling bad or any of those things. It's just okay, I didn't get it right that time. What information do I need to do better in this next repetition? What information do I need next time I try this same exact thing to make it work? And allowing yourself to make the mistakes and giving yourself realistic approximations. So if you fail, it doesn't mean that the next time you should be perfect either. If you're starting out doing something you've never done before, you should not expect yourself to be perfect the first time or the second time, or even maybe the hundredth time, depending on the skill. Um, Make realistic approximations for yourself, for your coworkers, for your birds, so that you can feel the reinforcement of success within itself. So those little steps, I think it's a new uh, Susan quote, um, celebrate approximations. I say that probably every day. It's a great, great um, quote, and it's very true. You have to look at how the progress that you're making, even if it's small. So I think if you can't, if you don't make mistakes, you're not going to learn anything anyways. I see that. (laughs) It's a great way to, um, Ryan just showed me a, a, (laughs) a bumper sticker of Susan's that says celebrate approximations. That's perfect. Um, but yeah, it's, a it's, the only way you're going to learn is by making mistakes. It's just how behavior works. So um, I think it's something that everybody should learn to embrace. And maybe if we all talked through or verbalized how we feel in those moments and had the support of our team, because it's natural to feel bad when you fail at something. But when your team supports you and then encourages you to go back out there with more information and try again, you can feel safer about taking those risks in the future. So feeling safe to make mistakes because they just become a chance to start again with more information. Yep, for sure. That's, that's definitely a Steve in, uh, impression. That that's that's quote taken from your article. By the way. Yes, <laughs> it's a quote I just stole from Steve. I can't take credit for that one. And, and you say as well in there, don't be afraid of consequences. Punishment is there to protect us. It is there so we don't hold the nail the same way twice and continue to smash our finger with a hammer. We need that feedback to survive, to improve, and to evolve. So embrace it and remember it means you are much closer to your goal. So what, what do you mean by that, getting much closer to your goal? So if you're starting out with zero knowledge and you make one mistake, you have that much more information to move forward and make another different mistake, maybe on your next try, um, you're that much closer. So, you know, the more you try, the more you learn. For us, we always think of everything as evolving. You know, we're, we've never reached the, and now this is it. We made it. And we continue to do this until forever because it works. We are always evaluating what we do. Um, Whenever we are the person speaking a show to guests, we always talk down our shows afterwards if time allows, which we try really hard to be able to do and just share notes with each other on little things. What if we said this? What if you changed the way you did this? What if your timing was a little different here? And it doesn't mean it was a show that wasn't good. It's just how can we continue to strive for better? There's always that next rung on the ladder that we're trying to reach. So 
yeah, I think every step is a clo- is another step closer to your goals of getting there and making it work and evolving along the way. Yeah, one of my favorite quotes is the fastest way to success is to double your failure rate. It's not for everyone, but I like it a lot. Mm-hmm. Hey, can you maybe give us some some personal stories, Ari, about learning, uh, about a situation where learning might have been challenging for you, but some of the things you've been talking about here today kind of helped you overcome this? Sure. That's a really good question. So how learning has been challenging for me? Yeah, how, how maybe you, you faced the failure or you faced the mistake and you had like, I'm going to, I'm not a neuroscientist, but I'm going to say like your, your amygdala and your reptilian brain kind of took over and, and it took a while for your cortex to kind of catch up. Um, so maybe, maybe, maybe a situation where you found yourself challenged and, and, and you forgot these things for a minute, but how, you, how kind of you overcame them? Yeah, so uh, I'm trying to think of like a specific story. I think one of the most challenging things that I faced recently, um, we've kind of been changing and evolving the dialogue in our show with our macaws. And a while back, Steve challenged us to kind of find a way that we could connect directly with the audience to where our they can feel our emotions when we're speaking about how much we care about the birds or um, why it's important for us to raise awareness about conservation of these birds, things like that, so that people really felt the way we feel. Even though we see it every day, we still love what we do and we want people to be on the same page as us. So um, our dialogue for that experience is very free form. We have some major points that we pick out. Um, and I had kind of fallen into a pattern when I was doing that regularly. So the challenge was to just throw it all out and start new so that you could get that fresh response from the audience and figure out some new things that worked. And I think for about a week, I probably did the worst shows I've ever done (laughs) because they were just off and didn't feel right. And I was trying to figure it out. And I felt like I was doing the same thing and we would end the show and I'd be like, oh, that was not good. And I could just feel how challenging it was taking feedback, not really getting anywhere. So we talked about it again, and it was just what is important to me that I want everybody out there to hear. And I think I just went back to basics and thought, how can I share this information on a level with these people that they'll listen and they'll care? Because when you have 20 birds flying around, guests aren't listening to you. They're looking at the birds flying around. So to connect with them, you have to say something that is really powerful. Um, so I think when I make those connections best is when I'm one-on-one with somebody and I, they ask a question after a show about the birds and then I really feel that connection. So I tried finally light bulb moment, I guess, and some advice from the team and from Steve, um, to do that while I was on mic. So I just talked about why I like what I do and I explained why welfare is important and I talked about why, training birds with positive reinforcement and giving them choice and control helped us share what they were seeing every day with everyone in the park. And that was a window for us to hopefully inspire some caring conservation action in at least a few people who were watching the show. And hopefully they walked away um, making a small change in their lives that would make a big change out in the wild for birds. So changing my show to be more of that kind of one-on-one connection and letting them understand what I was passionate about, I could feel a difference right away. And I understood what Steve had been talking about where before I was like, I don't know, I feel like I'm saying it, but I finally made that connection. So I was able to take those that leap and change it entirely, go through a challenging week of saying things that didn't feel right and finally getting to a pretty good result. And, um, it, it helped other people, I think, as well, that advice of just make the show your own and kind of connect on a level that's important to you. So it's a good learning experience for sure. And so <clears throat> you, you did a couple of shows and you, you said they were potentially some of the worst shows you think you might have ever done. Uh, and so, so you had to kind of go backstage after a show and we might we might even need to unpack what a show is for non-bird training people sure. that listen to the podcast uh, and 
And so what, what was your mental process like then? Like what made you super motivated to go out there again tomorrow and, and try something? Was it was it your personal outlook on life or was it the the team that surrounded you in that environment? Was it something else? Was it a combination of all of the things? What what, what were the, the most important contributors to you eventually finding that success? Yeah, so, um, well, our show where we have the parrots fly is kind of out in the open for the most part. It's not like your typical stage where you have a backstage. So our talk downs are usually like right out there. We're just walking back to the aviary where the birds live. Um, So we usually talk along the way and... um, it's only an eight minute experience. It's pretty short. So the birds would fly out. We would do the show. They would fly home. And then as we would walk back, we would talk through um, any notes about bird behavior, dialogue, anything that we felt was important to share with each other. Um, I think for me, I just, I wanted to get it right. So there was that part of it, but also um, I knew that I I had the support of my team to move forward and we we actually do six shows a day. So I was doing this time six times a day for like a week, which is a lot. And um, we were just talking through how to change little things. Like, what if I try this? What if we send the birds off the perch to go home when I say this word? Or, you know, just talking through it and saying, okay, I can do this better. Or, and nobody told me this is the worst show I've ever heard either. You know, they were supportive, but giving me feedback to help me improve. So I think if, you know, I came out of doing an experience and Steve was standing there and said, wow, that was terrible. I would probably (laughs) punish my uh, desire to get up there and do it again. But that's not the way to support a team. And Steve's really good at supporting us as well as our coworkers. So everybody just, you know, let's try this. What if we try this? So I was ready to just keep trying because nobody was saying, "Ugh, this is bad. Let's just not do it anymore because maybe somebody else should try it. It was the support of knowing that I could get it right and them wanting me to get it right as much as I did helped us along the way. Yeah, once again, I've, I mean, albeit a short time being in, in amongst uh, a, a small segment of that team. So you can attest to some of that. I've also been in my life uh, in teams where I I might use different labels to describe uh, how support was or not <laughs> uh, doled out to people. So for, for people listening to this show, who might be in a bird show or might be uh, in, a, in a shelter working with dogs or might be uh, working with horses in some context or a vet office or something and they might not have that supportive team um, and, to, and, and also to rewind a little bit before where we kind of explored this idea that if, if we don't feel that we're being heard by our management like it's kind of potentially up to us to take responsibility and figure out new ways to talk to our manager what, what advice can you give to to people that that might think like oh my god that was the worst show i've ever done and no one will talk to them about it and someone says that was a bad show uh and and, and but but thinking about everything we've just talked about as well that mistakes are opportunities to learn it's one step closer to your end goal uh, what advice do you have to give to someone that might be in a slightly different uh, set of antecedents than yourself Yeah. So I think, you know, you got to break it down just like you would anything else. You're not going to train all the behaviors to all the birds and all the show at one time. So if you try to think about how do I get my team to be some more supportive, how can I get my managers buy in and how can I make them not say, you know, that sucked basically, (laughs) you know, we want, we want their support. So we got to think about what do we want them to do? And, um, break it down into approximations. And if you need to start with yourself, um, I think that's a great starting point is changing your own behavior first and finding success in that. So if you do feel punished and you maybe have a little bit of learned helplessness going on because you haven't had that supportive environment where you've just kind of given up and don't feel like you want to try anymore. You have to find a way to inspire yourself to take that next step. And um, it could be something very little like today, you know, my boss who usually doesn't give me the time of day, I'm going to have a 
two minute conversation with them, whether it's about anything, just set a small approximation to start seeing some successes. And it can start with a conversation too. You know, if you have an environment where you feel punished regularly, um, find, find a person that maybe you feel comfortable talking with and pull them aside and have the conversation and ask them what you can do better that would help them interact with you in a way that will encourage more feedback and more positivity. So if I'm thinking about somebody who's maybe negative regularly, um, maybe they respond to comments or feedback right off the bat with kind of an attitude of negativity. Um, It can be hard in that moment to say, hey, what you just said felt kind of uncomfortable for me and I didn't like that. But if you know that's a regular thing with that person, you can always ask them on a day that you're not having um, the feeling that they're particularly negative or anything like that and pull them aside and just ask, hey, I've noticed this. I've noticed that sometimes you seem a little bit short. Are things okay? Is there anything I can do to help you? You seem stressed out. You ask them first because maybe there's something else going on in that person's life. And just connecting and knowing that you support them could help them react in a different way. Um, If you ask them if in the future, they would be comfortable if you felt uncomfortable in a situation to pull them aside. Then you've set up really nice antecedent arrangement to have that conversation in the moment at a later time. So just by saying, hey, sometimes I feel like you have an attitude when I offer information about the way you step up a bird. And it would it be okay if I just point that out to you because maybe I'm reading it wrong or maybe I'm just misunderstanding the way you're sharing information. But I'd like to talk with you about it because I want to be able to share this information and be able to learn from it. And just by bringing that person on your side almost, so it doesn't feel like it's you against them. You can open up the door for more conversations in the moment, which are so valuable in the future. So you said, I want, I want to share because I want to learn from it. So some some other terms you used when I was reading your article are effective learner and motivated learner. So, so there's different types of learners, would you say? Um, yeah, I think that there are some different types of learners for sure. I think if you are naturally motivated to learn something on your own, you're that person who is probably seeking out feedback, thanking people for feedback. Um, you want feedback in the moment more than likely. You're not somebody who wants to wait a day to learn about it. You want to make changes now and you want to make changes fast. And I think if you're motivated to learn in that manner and you ask all the questions that will encourage feedback from your peers and your management team, you'll be able to move forward pretty quickly. Um, just having the conversation and keeping in mind that, you know, any you can talk about anything as long as you're honest and kind there's there's any conversation even the toughest ones they can be uncomfortable but you can get through them if you just have some kindness empathy if you know people are going through things things like that to be able to um continue your path of learning some people like feedback um later which is okay too maybe they just feel like they can't be focusing on training a bird and nail trim and hearing somebody talking in their ear the entire time too. So they might be a person who you need to step away from the whatever's going on, talk it down, go back in, which also is, a you know, everybody has different learning styles. So it's a great way to learn as well. Um, identifying what kind of learner you are is so important so that the person giving feedback can say, hey, do you want to step away so we can talk about this? Or should I just be in your ear giving you feedback the whole entire time? So I think defining that before you um, start a training session is really, really helpful. And that applies to people too. So when you're working with your coworkers, just is it better when I see that I think you're upset to ask you right now or should I wait and pull you aside? Would you rather me, you know, talk to you in the mornings? What's the best way to share this information so that we can set ourselves up for success? Okay, so we're talking a little bit about um, some important parts of feedback. And when I was writing the paper um, on learning as humans, I asked 
Dr. Friedman to help me out um, by giving me feedback. What do you know about that? I like <laughs> feedback. So I asked Dr. Friedman to read my paper and to um, help me if I needed any help with editing or th- my science of behavior, but also any important points she felt would be good to add into this paper. And um, she came back within like 10 minutes with this amazing list of her 10 tips on um feedback. So you can check out the paper. It is posted on the Natural Encounters website, but um, some of those tips are so important. So I'm going to go through them really quick. Um, The first one is that feedback should be solicited among peers, not required. So it shouldn't be something that we make our staff do with each other. It should be something that everyone is seeking out from their coworkers, their peers, their management staff. Um, The next one is that feedback should start with questions and not conclusions. So instead of just coming to someone and telling them how they can change what they did, um, it's helpful to understand where they're coming from and start by asking some questions about whatever you're about to offer feedback on. Um, Feedback should include both positive observations as well as constructive criticism. So it's never good to just give all the negatives, um, but it's also important to share the things that people can improve and not just be positive. Um, Feedback should be observation oriented, not interpretation. So we are good scientists, which means we use observable behavior, um, not behavior that we might think is happening. So um, making sure that we're uh, using our observational skills is super important with any training um, that you're doing people or not non-humans or humans. Um, feedback should be informative and not evaluative. So very specific and not just vague judgments. Critical feedback should generally precede positive feedback so that the positive feedback doesn't become an S delta for punishment. So an S delta is something that I learned a lot about. It's one of my favorite things that I've ever actually trained, even though it's not the number one thing we go to, but when I actually saw it work in real time with birds, it kind of blew my mind. So just to explain a little bit, sidetrack about S deltas, um, it's uh, information that reinforcers are no longer available. So with our macaws, if we were flying 20 birds and they were going a half a mile out into the park and they came back before they were cued, we had to somehow tell them that was not when you were supposed to leave. There was um, some kind of information they needed to, to let them know you needed to stay out there a little bit longer and wait for that cue. So we created an S Delta by, um, putting one one of the windows in their aviary where they come home would be shut and the release window would be open. So they could go back into their release enclosure, which is their big aviary where they live, um, for no reinforcers. Or they could go back into the park. The release, or the, I'm sorry, the catch enclosure door would be shut and it had a big black panel on it. So it was very obvious to the birds, this is, there's no reinforcers here. Please go back out into the park. And at first the birds came home, they would sit on the building. Some of them would go back in their release. Um, But eventually what happened is they would come over the tree line. They would see that that door was shut with that big black panel and they would just loop and go right back into the park. It was so cool to see that science happen in real time. And it was one of the more challenging things to train because it's such a big behavior. But when it comes to um, giving critical feedback and that generally preceding positive feedback. If we do that all the time, then people are going to anticipate that that's what's going to happen. So if every time those birds came home, the door was shut, then they're not going to want to come home anymore. We want people to ask for more feedback. So that's kind of where that S Delta comes in there. Um, Critical feedback should always include what the person can do to change what they do. So we want to leave them empowered to change. So if we're offering up information. Hey, I think that this could have been a little bit different, but we don't say why or how. Um, We're not giving them any information to move forward. So we need to add that information to help them take that next step. 
people should always be given the opportunity to respond and discuss feedback. So you don't want to just give a bunch of information and walk away. It's very important to have that conversation. And feedback should be given in digestible quantities. It's a study of one. So prioritize um, the easiest to change first versus the most important. So you want people to have those Um, to be able to celebrate successful approximations. And then feedback should include follow-up and revision. This one's so important. Susan says, if you care enough to critique, then you should care enough to check on me. And I think that's really true. If you if you wanted to offer up some feedback, then come back and say, hey, how did that go? And it's good feedback for the person giving feedback. You know, hey, did what I say help? Was there a way I could have helped you more? Was there something I could have said differently that would have helped share this information in a better way? So always checking in is just a good practice when you're giving any kind of feedback. Yeah, cool. When I was trying to listen to you then, and <laughs> I just found myself reflecting on so many different situations in my life that had to do with feedback um so i am now a little bit distracted (laughs) but that's good hey i'm gonna try and do a overview of everything we just talked about to see how much i was paying attention and um you you can you can help make sure uh, we don't miss anything in in this brief uh, feedback for you about uh, the last 30 40 minutes so um we we want to be uh, looking for feedback regularly, uh, and that feedback, and then and the best way to get that feedback is by asking for feedback. That's right. Uh, and we we want to be using that feedback uh, as opportunities to move from where we currently are to where we want to go. Uh, and there's benefit in uh, consistently sharpening your sword. I just pulled that one out of the air. But I like that. <laughs> <laughs> what, I, what I was trying to get at was um, thinking the great thing we did today, is there a way we could possibly do it better tomorrow? And what happened today to help us learn what that new thing might be? Uh, and specifically in team environments, uh, supporting each other uh, and reinforcing feedback. Mm-hmm. So if you're if you're the if you're the person reinforcing feedback, let's because because I can't remember exactly if we talked about this, which means that it's probably worth repeating, even mm-hmm. if we did. Um, sure. What, what are, let's say let's say three top tips to reinforce feedback. If someone's giving you feedback, how can you reinforce the feedback giver? That's a really good question. So it's very important that we know our reinforcers are reinforcing. So we can't just high five someone and think that that's going to reinforce the behavior of giving feedback because maybe that person doesn't like touching you and we've just punished it. And now they're like, oh, next time I tell them something, they're going to high five me and I have to touch their hand and I hate germs and whatever. We could make up our own stories, but we want to make sure that it's reinforcing. So knowing the learner, because you're both learners really in any situation because of that feedback loop um, and knowing what's reinforcing. So if that person appreciates recognition, you know, they give you feedback and you go, oh my gosh, to your whole team, guess what Ryan just told me? It was so great. I want to share it with everyone. Maybe that's really enforcing to you, Ryan. And that's what you feel would encourage you to give more feedback in the future. Maybe you hate attention like that and you rather just get a hug. Maybe you're that kind of person, you know, like I really appreciate what you just said. Can I give you a hug? And maybe that's reinforcing. Um, Maybe it's just thanking someone. For me, if I have somebody just say, wow, thank you for that information. I so appreciate it and I appreciate you. That means a lot to me. That's all I need. I just need to know that that was welcome and that they wanted the conversation to happen and they enjoyed our time speaking together and that it was helpful. Um, following up can be another form of reinforcer for some people, but I think you got to do your research first. If it's somebody that you know really well, you probably already know, you know, like you have a good relationship with that person and you, you know, what would be reinforcing to them after a conversation like that. Um, I think it's important that if it was somebody approaching you with negative feedback, um, telling you something that might've been 
step out of their own comfort zone to share with you. Like we were talking about earlier with, you know, maybe somebody's attitude being challenging. If somebody came to me and said, Hey, when we talked earlier, I felt really uncomfortable. And I, you know, I tell that person like, wow, thank you for coming to me. I so appreciate, even though that was a hard conversation, I so appreciate that you talked to me about it. That, that can just take that kind of edge out of the air and let that person know that was okay what you just did. And I actually appreciate it. And I hope you do it again. Just being honest. And it's just, it's sometimes it's hard to be honest, but if we're kind and one of the things I point out in the paper too is don't confuse kind with sugar coating. You know, you don't want to just flowery it up with, oh, Ryan, you you did such a great job today. I really like when you say that thing and you're just, you know, putting too much sugar on it. It's just kindness is just about being true, sharing feedback and making sure that it comes from a good place. Um, don't, if your goal is to help that person, in the future and helps their growth and it comes from a good place, then it, it will also be kind. And that's really what it's about. Being true, giving feedback and making sure it comes from a nice place. Yes. Some of the other, some of the other words you use in that article are trust, relationships, honesty, resilience, and confidence. What are, what are some of these labels mean for you? Those are like some of my favorite words. So <laughs> so we'll start from the top. Trust. Okay. Trust. So that's a great one. So um, Dr. Friedman and Steve wrote an amazing paper. If you haven't read it out there, you should definitely read it called The Power of Trust. Um, my favorite thing in that paper starts at the beginning and it explains what trust looks like because you're right, those are all labels and we need to be good observers of behavior. So how do you operationalize trust? How do we explain what trust looks like? And um, they do that in this paper. So in the paper, they operationalize trust in really clear observable terms by simply saying it is a level of certainty that in Interaction will result in good outcomes, and so interaction increases. So that's pretty amazing that they were able to operationalize trust. And um, it is one of my favorite words. And um, Steve talks about our bank account and filling our trust bank account and making deposits into the bank account through positive reinforcement. And you might sometimes have to make a withdrawal. So with birds, that might look like um, an emergency vet visit where you have to grab the bird. And you may make a withdrawal from your trust account because of that. But if you've made a lot of deposits in that trust account over time with the bird, um, you have you basically will not go bankrupt. So making that withdrawal is just going to um, take some of your deposits out of your account, but it won't make you bankrupt. And after you grab the bird, you put him back in his enclosure and you ask him to step up, he probably steps up right away. But if you don't have a lot of deposits in your trust account to start off with and you have to grab that bird and you do bankrupt your account, that probably looks like the bird doing everything it can to get away from you after that experience. So with people, it can be the same thing. Um, if you have a really full trust account, with your coworkers and you have to give some negative feedback, it's not going to decrease the likelihood that they want to interact with you on a regular basis. But if your trust account is pretty low or even bankrupt already and you make a withdrawal, those people are going to try to avoid you on a regular basis. So there is plenty of um, observable behavior we can look at and check ourselves on our trust accounts with our animals and with our human counterparts. And the other words were relationships and honesty. But I'm, I'm really, really interested to unpack the, the two labels, resilience in, in confidence, what do these mean to you? So um, resilience is probably my favorite of all of those words. And <laughs> I think that it is just a really cool um, label, I guess, is the best way I could put it. It's, it. It is built through positive reinforcement. It's built through big trust accounts. Resilience is created because, I mean, there's the age old saying, you know, like if you fall off a horse, are you going to get back on? Well, 
if you are a resilient person, you're going to get back on that horse. And um, resilience is just something that we can work to build in our birds and in our coworkers as well. Um, and it's just through all of those things, all of those other labels, so trust, honesty, everything helps you build resilience in your um, counterparts, whether they're animal or human. And I think it's just a really cool thing to see when you see somebody, um, respond positively to negative feedback when they're excited to hear, Hey, Steve just told me that I should try this next show or that feedback you gave me was really great. And I can't wait to try it again. I mean, that's, that's when I really can like see resilience because the little bit of negative feedback, Hey, I think your timing was a little bit off. Maybe we could try this. Do you have any thoughts? And that person go, Oh, you're right. I can't wait to try it. It's just it's such a cool thing to see and it encourages more feedback. It builds trust on both sides of the coin. It builds relationships. Um, it's just proof that honesty is really the way to go when you're giving feedback and moving through these things. All right. The, some of the words we were talking about, they were trust, relationship, and honesty, and you used all of those words in your definition <laughs> of resilience. <laughs> they do really go hand like in that. hand. You're totally right. I know I'm like a really terrible dictionary, but um, <laughs> it's it. they all go hand in hand and they all help um, build off of each other. So you can't you can't have just honesty because a lot of those other things – might not fall into place so it kind of all has to go together and, and some of the other stuff just just to continue my efforts to uh test my recollection of everything we've covered and you, you see when asking for feedback make sure you mate you manage your body language so you, you're asking it you, your words are, are not saying one thing with your body language saying something else um and so, so honesty kind of potentially is another label we could put in there make sure it's all congruent mm -hmm. uh and 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 if you need to teach yourself to learn be a splitter rather than a lumper and uh see if you can break your behavior down like like we would with our birds or our dogs or our horses or whatever we're training yeah hey looking at looking at the time mary i'm going to end this part of the podcast we've got one more little thing i want to touch base with you on before we finish uh with a quote from you <laughs> in your article and it is you can always learn new ways to do old things and you should always be seeking out new information to improve what you already know Hey, thank you so much for sharing all of that today, Ari. I think that's going to be super beneficial. I've been wanting you, I've been wanting to get you on the show to talk about this stuff for ages, simply because, firstly, it's a great topic that I know is so helpful for everyone. But secondly, because I've had such great feedback from so many people that have had seen you at workshops and conferences and stuff. So really grateful we got this opportunity to to touch base and and spread this out to this is, this will go to thousands of people over the next uh, wee while. So really excited about this. So the last little thing I wanted to hear from you, Harry, just before we wrap up, I just wanted to know, we, we started off with your journey at the small zoo in, or wildlife or theme park, whatever label we place on that place in Florida. We started off at the start of your journey. Can you now take us into the future? What what do you want to see happen in the next five to ten years in the animal training world, but also with, with all of this feedback stuff we've been talking about today? Yeah, that's a really great question. You know, I think I we've been focusing a lot on different things that are these big paradigm shifts in the world of what we do every day. And um, I think sometimes I've seen colleagues get frustrated along the way trying to effectively make changes that aren't happening as quickly as we would like. But I love history. And I think big picture wise for me, we have to remember that change takes time. And if we look back, you know, even 20 years ago, how drastically different we're doing things and how much better um, welfare we would provide for our animals and how hard we've worked to get there. 20 years ago, some of the things we do today, we would have never imagined. So I um, kind of 
have a little hobby of collecting old zoo books. Um, the books you used to get when you would go to a facility, you'd walk in the door, it'd be about the zoo. Um, many years ago, they used to be your signage almost. So you would take the booklet around with you and it would tell you what was in every single exhibit. And those are kind of just amazing snapshots of what our jobs used to look like and what people who had the same passions that we had were doing 10, 20, 50, 100 years ago. And I think if we look at this as big picture, that we are making changes now and they might not all happen tomorrow, but we are changing things for the future and keep that in mind that we're making a difference and looking back helps us to move forward. I hope that, um, people really start to study behavior in depth and apply it in all aspects of their life so that their eyes can be opened to um, just the positivity that comes from it. Feeling like you're in a safe environment, being able to share information so that we can move forward and not having those old adages like, this is how we've always done this, or, um, well, this is how I learned it. So, here we go, so down the same path. I, I hope we are encouraging everyone in the field currently and people coming into the field to look towards a future of growth so that we're always trying to to reach that next level and um, that will help us move forward faster, I think. Um, I think we're really on that path. I think I can see changes in the 10 years I've worked for NEI. I see changes just within NEI that I can tangibly look at, which is pretty amazing. 20 years back, I'm sure it looked a lot different. So it's pretty cool to see the forward momentum. But remember, it takes time. Some wise words. Hey, Eri, just before we do officially wrap up, oh, actually, rewind, Ryan. Gratitude to you. Thank you for for sharing that. And uh, it's definitely a future that I think the audience of this show will resonate with. Uh, And if you're listening to the show, then you're probably in that growth mindset already, um, trying to learn new things and improve yourself. Um, Before we do officially wrap up, Gary, we've already mentioned it numerous times throughout the episode, but can you just please remind everyone listening uh, where they can go to find out more about um, some of the organizations you've mentioned today and some of the things you've talked about in Natural Encounters, IAA, TE, et cetera? Yeah, for sure. So first, I want to also thank you, Ryan, because you are a great learner. You did a really good recap. You constantly are asking questions and I appreciate that. And I super appreciate your podcast because sharing information is so important. And this is a way, new way, I think people are kind of developing and figuring out how much we can use technology like this to share information with the rest of the world, whether that world is our field of animal training or whoever's out there listening. So thank you for what you do and for being a good learner as well. I'm sure you take a ton out of all of the podcast interviewees that you have on the show. So really, really cool. Yeah, it's all about me, everyone. <laughs> um, there, there is numerous reasons for doing this podcast, but one of them purely is selfish. I just get to hang out with amazing people every week and talk about cool stuff. Um, the other one is obviously to, to disseminate all of this amazing information and help more animals and more people. Um, to just, just remind everyone where where they can go to find out more about uh, natural encounters, IAAT, all yep. that kind of stuff. For sure. So um, Natural Encounters has a website. It's naturalencounters.com. We have pretty much all of the papers that anyone on our staff has written posted under um, paper presentations on the website. And you can find out a little bit about our trainers, our management staff, all that good stuff. Um, IAATE is website is IAATE.org. Um, recently, um, we've started doing webinars, which is really cool. New technology for us that we're learning and developing. And that's been a lot of fun figuring out and um, finding a new way to reach our members and beyond. Um, 
being an IAAT member has a lot of benefits. So I encourage anybody in the field, please go check it out. Um, it's one of the more affordable memberships for an organization out there and you get a ton out of it. And there are a lot of really amazing, hardworking, dedicated people that are involved to help um, share information with all of our members. Um, IATCB for the certification test. The website is IATCB.org. Um, you can go on there and check out all kinds of things um, about the certification test that we talked about earlier. And I think that covers all of those cool organizations that we were talking about. And you're on social media as well? Yeah, that's right. So Natural Encounters Facebook page is pretty awesome, I have to say. Um, Who manages it? Is it you? I started it and then I... <laughs> ah. um, Megan Geddes is one of our trainers. She, I know Megan. Yeah, Megan's awesome. She took over the Facebook page a while ago, actually, um, just because I had too many things on my plate and she had a very big interest in that kind of social media and sharing information that way. So there's a whole team of people that work from NEI um, to post different things about NEI, share information that we find interesting with everybody. And I think that they are doing an awesome job. I, you know, I look at it more as a, um, a guest than somebody who's putting into it anymore. So they're doing a really, really amazing job. But the Facebook page is a lot of fun. And we love when people interact with us there. So if you're commenting or sending us messages, we try to respond as quickly as we can because we want to encourage that behavior for sure. And um, IAATE also has a Facebook page. Their Facebook page is amazing, run by Dave Miller. He is an awesome trainer. He does some amazing papers at IAATE as well, doing some amazing work and just an all-around great guy. He's actually taught me just about everything I know about using social media the way we do for the NEI Facebook page or otherwise. So um, that Facebook page is pretty cool. So check it out as well. And um, IATCB has a Facebook page as well, so you can check that out too. So a couple different options. And for NEI, we're looking at maybe possibly growing it to Twitter and Instagram since we have a pretty big following there. Yeah, wonderful. And of course, we will link to all of this in the show notes to make it nice and easy for you, the podcast audience. Hey, Erie, this has been so much fun. Once again, from myself and on behalf of everyone listening, we really appreciate you for coming on the show today and for taking time to catch up with me a few weeks ago, sending messages back and forth and, and all the time, attention, effort you've put into creating this wonderful piece of content today. Thank you so much. Thank you. It was a pleasure to talk with you, Ryan, as always. <laughs> I agree. And everyone out there, we really appreciate you tuning in as well. If you've enjoyed this episode and you're interested in carrying on the conversation about working with our animals and people in the most positive, funnest, choice-rich ways, then as mentioned at the start of the episode, the Animal Training Academy community is waiting for you. Head on over to www.animaltrainingacademy.com and click on the membership button in the main menu to learn more about what members are describing as the Netflix social media platform platform for behavior geeks there's something there for absolutely everyone and we're looking forward to having you join the tribe that's it for this episode though we're going to wrap it up there thanks again so much for listening everyone and you'll hear from us again soon